Um, well, seeing as okay. we're five minutes in, I might welcome everyone into the room. Just say thank you all for coming. Today's session is Think Like a Gardener, designed for beginnings, not endings. Um, before I hand you over to the wonderful Cam Perkins, I'm just going to run through some quick housekeeping. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me all in the room, I'm Ella. I work with the team up in Catalyze up in Tamaki Makoto. Um, so welcome everyone today. Before we start, um, just so everyone is aware, this session is being recorded. Um, please ensure that you're on Zoom throughout the session, but introduce yourself and ask questions in the chat, and there will be time for discussion at the end as a group. Um, if you're on gallery view, you'll be able to see all the speakers and everyone who's joined us today, which is always, I think, the best way. Um, yeah, that's all the housekeeping for today, so I'll hand it over to Cam. Kia ora koutou katoa. I'm just waiting for my final guest, who is an integral part of our presentation, to join us, um, as usual. Uh, uh, even after 18 months of technology, um, we still have a couple of issues. So hopefully Peter is on his way. He, so He has um, just joined. Wonderful. Afternoon. Sorry, team. I can't even blame commuting when you're sitting at your desk and you're not allowed to leave your house. You can't. You can't, <laughs> Pete. Well done. That's good. I'm glad you could make it. So let's get cracking. I will share my screen. Can everyone see place. my screen? You do, Kings. I thought you might, mate. This is especially <laughs> for you. This is the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kyoto Katoa. Uh, when we think about our built environment, places which accommodate the very young and the very old are loved by everyone else too. We know what makes places great for humans. So, why do we find it so difficult to change? Placemaking Aotearoa heard recently from Greer Hawley, one of our Waka Kotahi colleagues, uh, about the evaluation of our innovating streets pilot. And today we're really keen to continue that conversation with a dive into collaboration to understand how we can all play a role in enabling placemaking in Aotearoa. And I'm joined today by Anna Nord and Peter McGlashan, and together we're really excited uh, for this Ako Ako session with you all. So thank you so much uh, for giving up your time. So Anna and Peter, if I could please ask you to introduce yourselves and then we'll get started. Sure. Kia ora koutou, ko Anna, aho, ke waka kotahi, aho e mahiana. Um, yes. And kia ora koutou, uh, ko um, hikarangi te maunga, ko waipu te awa, ko ngati parau te iwi, um, ko Peter McGlash and toko ingoa. I uh, work at Waka Kotahi. I had the good fortune of having three weeks uh, at Waka Kotahi before we went into lockdown. So while I have been working here for, I think it's four months now, um, I've only had three weeks in the office. Um, but it's great to see some familiar faces uh, on the call and look forward to sharing some of our insights. Thank you. Uh, so, i tipu ake au, i te rohe o te iwi kondamuka, no te whenua o te moi moi aho, ke i tamaki makoto tapu kainga, ko Cam Perkins toku ingoa. Uh, so, I grew up in the region of the Kondamuka people. You might know that as the coastal areas around Brisbane in Queensland in Australia. Uh, te whenua o te moi moi a is the Māori translation of land of the dreaming, aka the West Island, aka uh, Australia. Uh, now I now live in Auckland and that's where I'm joining you from today uh, and I'm helping the multimodal and innovation team within Waka Kotahi with the Innovating Streets program which many of you have been involved in. We've got a lot of change to make and we're going to have to collaborate like mad as our good friend Neil McEnroy would say and work together to create energy um, and if things work we can sing from the rooftops we can persuade by uh, by sharing impact and then of course the person responsible for the title of our discussion Brian Eno uh, what does he mean by think like a gardener well, when we build a building, we finish a building. Uh, but when we build a garden, 
we don't necessarily finish a garden. Uh, we start uh, and then it carries on with its own life. So thinking like a gardener is an analogy to say that we as composers, as designers uh, and placemakers should think of ourselves as people who start processes rather than simply finish them. Uh, and that the journey will hold surprises that we didn't plan for or think of or expect. So with collaboration and planting seeds in mind, I want to pose a question to you all. How might we apply the evolutionary superpower of storytelling to help us make the changes that we need to make? And when I'm talking about evolutionary superpower, I'm talking about a process developed over a period of 100,000 years. When we started developing our language, we used storytelling to transfer knowledge from generation to generation. 40,000 years ago, we started transferring knowledge from generation to generation through cave paintings. Three and a half thousand years ago, we started transferring knowledge from generation to generation through text. 28 years ago, we invented PowerPoint. Which one do you think we're most adapted to? So what happens when we forget about the superpower of storytelling? What happens when we forget to plant that seed? What happens when we design an outcome and not a process? Many of the issues around delivering lasting and meaningful change come down to, you guessed it, human behavior. So are we telling our stories of change in the right way? One of the big lessons from my career in design is that corporations spend incredible amounts of, mo of money and time trying to understand humans, their customers. For corporations, uh, it means big business. And it's got me to thinking over the years, what if we put that much effort into curating our cities and understanding the way that people want to work together? So I've made it my mission to help everyone understand a process of change. So let's start with something really obvious. Uh, pens at the ready, the secret to lasting and meaningful change is not innovation. We often hear about innovation as the, as the savior of the future. Technology is not coming to save us. It's the real secret. It's connection. Storytelling is the most powerful tool on the planet. Why? For 100,000 years, humans have passed down that knowledge through storytelling. Our brains are hardwired for stories. So when we're interested in helping people with change, in influencing, uh, in connecting, collect and tell stories in your work. How are we starting to apply the, um, the evolutionary superpower of storytelling in our work through Waka Kotahi? One way we're doing this is through, uh, through the innovating streets and using a community of practice, many of, who, uh, many of which uh, joining us today have been involved in. Innovating Streets, uh, as you know, aims to make it easier and faster uh, for practitioners to make our streets safer and cleaner, more livable, and we're working with communities to do it together. So changing our streets is really complex and challenging work. And despite the, the hard work of dedicated and innovative people uh, like all of you on the call in our towns and cities, and all of the willing teams that we're working with, there's many, many issues to address before we can actually meet those goals. So while there's no silver bullet to be able to uh, solve these issues, supporting our practitioners is vital. And done well, this can significantly grow people's capability and improve the good impact of New Zealand's limited resources. So research tells us that of all the ways for a sponsor agency to support practitioners to do really complex, uh, challenging work, communities of practice have been found to be by far the most effective and efficient way. So we're trying out a community of practice to support practitioners around the country. In our pilot program over the last 12 months, we grew our crew from a handful to a group of over 300 professionals uh, across a range of different professions. So through Innovating Streets over that period, we delivered 64 street pilot projects uh, around the country. And we're using the lessons from that phase to shape up a significant scaling up of the program. 
we all know this wasn't an easy process. Uh, many of you know this. And uh, for many of the projects, which is where the peer support for the community of practice really came into play, we've seen that through this very, very short amount of time that people have developed great bonds. Uh, they've connected really well over the challenges that they faced um, in changing the ways that we are working. And we're still learning and we know it's not perfect, but we're all learning together. And we're able to tell our stories of change along the way. And importantly, when we tell stories, we come across, uh, we come across intersections, uh, not like a road intersection, but actually idea intersections. And that's where we start to see those surprising solutions to our most wicked problems. What's the other way? Uh, what's the other thing that we can do when we tell stories? Well, we can plant seeds. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Anna Nord uh, to talk to you about what we've got growing around Aotearoa. Kia ora, Anna. Kia ora. Thanks, Cam. Um, so building off of what Cam said at the beginning um, around um, designing like a gardener and not having a prescribed outcome of how something will grow, um, that's really how the Innovating Streets for People program was designed. It was to um, plant a seed and plant a lot of seeds across the country. Um, so the Innovating Streets for People program um, had over 160 applications. And of that, we funded and awarded funding to 78 projects across the country, um, really with the emphasis of being able to um, learn through experience. Go to the next slide. Um, so the program was really emphasized, emphasized um, building sector capability and being able to identify barriers that are preventing um, a rapid rollout of a connected bicycle network or just transforming our streets into places where people like to be able to spend time. Um, so before we kicked off the Innovating Streets for People program, we asked everybody how easy or how difficult it would be um, to deliver an Innovating Streets project, a tactical urbanism project. And everybody, um, for, the, or for the majority, we all knew, okay, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult. We asked the same question after this um, program. And to get to the next slide. We, and it was very clear that it was a lot more difficult than everybody had expected it to be. Um, and, we, you know, so the, the majority of people definitely said, this is extremely difficult. This is very difficult. We, we didn't anticipate it. Um, and we definitely felt that way at a national level and know that you felt that way um, at the project level. And so before the program kicked off, again, we asked people to rate um, the practitioner's capability. We can go to the next slide. Um, and we asked them to rate the capability in the whole spectrum. So from defining the problem to managing the project um, and people, it was a very much a 50-50 split. So everybody said, yeah, you know, practitioners have, um, some capability in this. Um, after the program, when we asked the same question, we had a change. And so the majority of people, again, could you go to the next slide? I don't know why it's plugged that way. Anyways, um, the majority of people um, said that they had less capability. Um, this doesn't mean that our skills have gone down through the past of the program, but it's more of a realization of what it takes to do these projects. And so, and could you go to the next one? Um, the realization was that we need to, we don't have, it's actually really hard to co-design a project with people, that it's not the, um, it's not easy. It's not something that you could just like hand over to your communications person and have them lead that. Um, we learned that, we need to, we're not really, um, a, we don't have this, the muscles really toned to be able to um, implement trials to inform a permanent design. That's something that we still need to really build knowledge on. And then monitoring and evaluating. And it's not just a monitoring and evaluating of like how to collect the data, um, but it's more about how do you use the data in telling a story? How do we relay that? Um, and those are skills that we've, it's 
not that we're going back in our ability to do it. Again, it's just like a realization of, oh, like this is really hard work and we need a lot of people um, and a lot of placemakers like you to be able to make the project work. Um, so recognizing that it was still a very tough year um, for everybody, that doesn't mean that you know every project failed. And in fact, like we had some very beautiful projects that were able to bring in um, placemakers and designers and bring a lot of people together to produce what I think are just absolutely beautiful pieces of artwork and places where I love spending time and have been visiting several times. Go to the next one. <laughs> I don't know why all of these are set to like individual. I don't know what I did with PowerPoint, apologies. Um, so speaking of one of um, the, the beautiful, the many beautiful projects within the Innovating Streets for People program. This is the Wanganui um, Drews Avenue. And in this, um, they went beyond, you know, our scope and which our scope was kind of limited. Okay, you need to do some things within the roadway, but they knew um, and the placemakers there knew that in order to make um, the roadway active, you needed to put a bench along the side of the, the building. You needed to be able to tell the story of the place. It wasn't just about reclaiming a parking spot, but it's about what you put in and how you um, utilize all the elements um, in a space. And so again, there's so many projects that have really good examples of storytelling um, and visioning. I can go to the next one. Um, to the left, you have the Golden Bay Tasman District Council um, high school project where they, um, the kids really worked on a beautiful piece of artwork to tell the story of um, the springs and the mountains around them. And you have so many examples within this program of working with kids to envision like what is, um, what should our streets be like? So this girl on the left has the street as what it is today and then what her vision is on the right which is um, a beautiful place of rainbows. Um, anyways, so the program, this is a very much a short synopsis of the program evaluation and um, some learnings, but the learnings that we're capturing, I guess, are, are gonna be articulated through um, the program evaluation, which will be up on the website, but then also um, we're still learning and we're, we're very much still capturing um, ideas and so, it's a continuous conversation about um, what's working and what's not and how we can continue to grow the garden. Awesome, Anna, thanks for that. So I'm gonna try and steal control from my end and we'll see if this works or whether or not we end up skipping through and Cam has to jump in. Um, but for those of you who may follow me on Twitter, uh, you might've seen that I had the joy of delivering um, an Innovating Streets project uh, for the Mongkiki Tamaki local board. Um, and we were an applicant, this is before I started at Waka Kotahi, to deliver a low traffic neighborhood in the area. Um, low traffic neighborhoods are probably one of the hardest uh, traffic interventions to install because it really is challenging people's traditional thinking about how they can move through spaces. And uh, it's not as simple as just taking away a car park, you are completely blocking a, a road and preventing vehicular traffic move through and encouraging uh, walking and cycling through instead. Um, I, I'm not sure if I can click through cam or not, but uh, this is the first day that we knew that we were in trouble because these large wooden boxes that we were going to use, they were supposed to be painted when they arrived and due to a procurement breakdown, they arrived um, bare boned and uh, that meant that they weren't going to last very long before the weather started to eat away at their natural plywood. They're actually a fruit crate, which we repurposed, um, kept about five or six guys in work by choosing this option. But we knew as soon as they arrived uh, unpainted that we had to come up with a creative solution. So fortunately for us, we had someone who many of you know, Boopsy, uh, involved in our project and we started tossing around ideas as to what the options were. So we came up with a painted crate day uh, on about three days notice and it really was a great way to start those conversations in the community about what this project was about, um, how particularly families were going to benefit from it um, and start to see those conversations from a placemaking perspective to let people see what's possible when you take the road corridor and you use it um, and add it back into the public realm. 
Uh, next slide, Cam. Um, so this was, uh, I guess, a bird's eye view of what we delivered. Um, the low traffic neighborhood was over a large area. So two of the streets that we closed had over 5,000 cars a day use them before we intervened. Um, the reason we intervened is we had a lot of complaints from the members of the public about wing mirrors being damaged, about um, traffic congestion. These were two parallel roads in the heart of um, suburbia in, in Onihanga, and uh, they were residential streets. They shouldn't have had 5,000 cars a day on them, um, but people were rat running using GPS, using Google Maps to basically find the quickest way home, and Google Maps is very, very good at uh, optimizing the use of the entire network, uh, which is basically transport code for sending thousands of cars down your little quiet uh, leafy street to try and save people 30 or 40 seconds uh, away from the arterial road. So we set about trying to, to have a couple of major interventions. One of them is this intersection here, which was um, the artwork was designed by a local artist, Amelia Puya Taylor from 312 Hub. Um, we tried to employ local businesses. Um, this is the chap from the uh, stencil company, which is only about 200 meters away from this intersection. His company had been making stencils for, I think, 40 or 50 years um, in Onihanga, um, and he was really pleased. His whole staff came along to watch these being used because it was kind of the closest to home project that ever had. Um, and the story behind the pattern uh, was a local story. So Amelia touched on her understanding of the local whenua and her designs were representative of the lava caves that flow underneath Onihanga and were used as um, storage pits or, or transport options for Māori um, pre-colonial uh, contact. So we did as much as we could to include local artists, uh, include local businesses and really have that local story to try and stack the deck and give ourselves the best chance of success. Um, uh, but as we know with some of these projects, as we saw in some of the headlines, um, you can't win over everyone all of the time. Next slide, Cam. So this is kind of what happens um, when you, if you do want to hold it there, that's uh, a box on the left. Again, another example of the box being unpainted, but by giving permission to the people who live next to these boxes, um, it did shift the conversation. They went from being these large obstructions that people objected to because they didn't understand the why to being things that they could start to own. And this particular one on Gray Street um, got owned by this whānau that lived right next to it and uh, their kids loved um, using it as, a, as a, a public art space for them. Um, you could be uh, confused for thinking that the lady on the left with her kids um, standing in the middle of the street, uh, the fact that there was the street was so safe that she could stand there to have the photo taken um, may be a supporter of the project. Uh, but unfortunately, she was one of many who couldn't look past the inconvenience to them and their whānau and understand the bigger picture and the fact that this really was about changing the way people thought about transport and space and the fact that roads um, are a huge amount of land which cities use uh, and provide, which are effectively out of the public realm now. So we had to deal with headlines like that one. Uh, the original headline said that we'd spent over $800,000 on plywood boxes. Um, we'd spent about 40,000. So a substantial um, difference between the headline and what was actually real in, in the project. And that was the type of battle that we had. So despite the efforts to kind of add as much placemaking as possible, there was a real challenge challenge um, and we all face it with the role of social media and, and how community Facebook pages can often end up much more powerful or responsive than large bureaucratic comms teams. Um, so it really is critical that uh, the role of local knowledge that placemakers have, the understanding of who's important, who to talk to, um, who's trusted uh, is a critical addition uh, for these types of projects. Came okay, on to that next one. These are some wonderful examples of, of the type of interventions uh, that we've had. Uh, as Anna mentioned, 70 odd projects across the country meant that there was a huge range of solutions to local problems, um, be it uh, those ones on the top right, which are actually cow troughs to drink out of, 
um, the choice was to use a local material that people were familiar with in Matamata and some of the other rural uh, locations. And they obviously work really well for garden beds. So having the local community and to plant those beds out helps uh, resolve some of the issues. So if you click through a couple of times, Clam, so that the role of placemakers really for us as peacemakers, um, you guys are the ones that can come in and understand the local landscape um, you know the problems because you've probably been there before with the projects that you've already attempted. And so it's critical that um, organizations like Placemaker Aotearoa or collectives like you guys can really be seen as, as um, people who can provide guidance and strategic direction into the best choices and, and how to resolve some of the potential headaches which um, bureaucratic organizations struggle to unpack. Next slide. Uh, keep going. So the three major lessons, I guess, that we had come out of the projects was definitely around the team. The team is really important. Um, community partnerships, as mentioned, is critical. And aesthetics does matter. Next slide, Cam. So as mentioned, um, for those of you that were involved in Innovating Streets, it was, it was a pretty brutal introduction into tactical urbanism. Um, the tempo was relentless. Um, it was often a stretch for the bureaucracies that we came from. Um, the the organisations that we came from were quite risk adverse. And so often when some of these challenges came about, um, uh, it was left up to a few to solve many problems. So the team that you put together is really, really important. Um, and the most successful projects had a really balanced team um, who provided a range of support and, and um, problem solving. Next one. Uh, genuine community partnerships are critical as mentioned. So the projects that were most successful, unsurprising to you guys, I'm sure, were the ones who had a genuine understanding as to um, who the community were that they were looking to serve and what the potential outcomes could be. So on the left-hand side there, the Mangari project, um, Amelia was involved in that project as well. And it was critical to get young people involved in the design and the storytelling and, that, and in the implementation and the delivery on the ground. Um, and some of you will know uh, Isabella on the right-hand side there, um, you know, having people who are well connected who can steer those conversations is critical because it's fair to say traffic engineers uh, aren't great at holding public meetings and they have a place within the team but it's important that we recognize the best um, that each part of the fit team uh, can offer. Next slide. Um, yeah, and it was crucial also to get across the point that temporary doesn't negate the importance of placemaking and aesthetics. So again, the most successful projects were the ones that paid some care and attention to how things looked at the end. Um, you never knew who you were talking to residence wise and what feedback you were gonna get. Some people would complain uh, that you were doing a temporary version and wasting money on that. You should just do a permanent solution. Other people really liked the fact that it was a temporary solution because there wasn't, their ratepayer dollars weren't being wasted on a solution, a permanent solution that they didn't want. So for that to work for all parties, it's critical that um, the aesthetics of how it appears comes across in a way which um, people don't despise. So it's fair to say our plywood boxes came with a bit of a reputation and we were quite early on in the piece. And I'd like to think that we forged a path for others to learn from our mistakes. But um, these two examples here of the Ferry Road project in Christchurch and the Emily Place project in uh, Auckland are really good examples which have become critical spaces in COVID. Uh, the residents that live around that space in Emily Place really appreciate the fact that there's a safe place uh, close to their apartments which doesn't put them at risk during a social distance. So next slide, Cam. Yep. Uh, so that kind of finishes up. So I'll pass back to Cam. Yeah, um, So we wanted to have some discussion today with you all online around uh, how this program can um, can better empower placemaking Aotearoa as a collective um, to be involved in streets of people. And we wanted to have a chat about what that might look like. Um, so uh, last year's uh, last year's program, there were some of you involved in that, and you've got some scars from that, and you've got some uh, some some triumphs from that. Um, and so, as we move into this next phase and talking about scaling up, um, both from a size and an impact perspective, is um, is uh, is around this question: How can we empower uh, uh, this group to be involved? Um, I'm not sure if there's some questions immediately uh, coming through. 
Yeah, there, there is a question in there, um, but feel free to to drop some questions into the chat. But there's, uh, there's one in particular there, Cam, which I'm happy to pick up on about um, the level of community engagement that preceded the installation of the boxes. You happy for me to pick that up? Let's do that and then we'll get into it. If people can have a think about that question on the screen, then we'll come back to the discussion. Cool. So, um, so to Catherine's point about um, community engagement preceding the installation of the boxes. So, like I mentioned, this was a pretty brutal lesson in um, how to do tactical urbanism. It was something that not too many people in our team had done before. Um, and uh, we really did choose the most difficult uh, intervention to put in a low traffic neighborhood. 5,000 cars a day were no longer allowed to use their favorite rat run. Um, and so we did our best to get the word out. Um, uh, three or four um, local newspaper articles about the project before the project started. We had a, a public um, a public meeting, design meeting um, before Christmas, which had about 70 to 80 people at it. Um, we had websites where people could provide feedback. We did letterbox drops. Um, so we kind of did as much as we thought we could within the time frame. Um, it didn't help the fact that the day before we were about to do a letterbox drop, uh, Auckland dropped into level three and all of a sudden no one was allowed to deliver anything into letterboxes. And yet we'd already locked in the contractor to do the installation in two weeks time. So we were in COVID right up till the day uh, the contractors arrived in their high-vis vests to start installing it. And that really did um, harm our ability to get the story out there. The other challenge though with um, stopping a road with 5,000 cars a day on it is you don't know where they live. Yeah. And so probably three and a half to 4,000 of those people didn't live within the letterbox drop area. They didn't read the Onehanga news because they lived in Hillsborough or they lived in East Tamaki or they lived elsewhere in the city. So the nature of the intervention really did mean that we were not at a hiding to nothing, but we had a much tougher task reaching all of the people. It's fair to say when we put a wooden box in the middle of the road and said, thou shalt not pass, people noticed the project. So it's the, they had more um, feedback on this than they did on the unitary plan uh, from our neck of the woods. So um, the nature of the intervention definitely led to a high level of uh, conversation. Um, would I do different things differently? Yes. Um, but at the same time, there was also always going to be a little bit of um, eggs broken along the way, I guess. Uh, and did we have any community groups involved? Yes. Um, so uh, the public workshop was in a public space connected to the local um, Pacifica health provider. 312 Hub had been heavily involved. Um, all of the usual groups that council works with for these types of projects were involved. But again, I think the problem was we were putting 5,000 people's noses out of joint and um, we didn't know where they lived. They weren't the people who lived three doors down from the intervention. They lived four or five kilometers away and they might not have found out about the project until day four. Um, so we did as much as we can, but you can always do more. Thanks, Pete. So, Fano, we haven't got any other questions coming in. Um, and if we do, we'll come back to them. But really today was about having that just having this discussion with you as a cohort um, around that question about empowering place making Aotearoa around the country um, as a group of people who are inherently connected, involved in your communities. Um, we wanted to have a, a discussion on what that might look like. So I would uh, absolutely welcome people to put your hand up. Um, Take yourself off mute, say hello, um, ideas forth. I'll get one started for you. Um, th that was really awesome. I really appreciate that guys. And and I think the, just highlighting the awareness, you know, we know what we don't know. Um, we're a bit closer to that now, um, which is really cool. And I've seen that in practice and also just, um, you know, um, fanboying across the uh, country with other projects. So really appreciate the opportunity for that. Um, and then also um, appreciate the, the really awesome uh, social infrastructure you guys have put in place for that community of practice and how um, I suppose placemaking Aotearoa has um, overlaps with that as well. And so there's a lot of kind of resource sharing I think that can be done um, without necessarily having to create anything new. 
um, you know, simple things like being able to lean on each other for um, lessons on as something as simple as what's the best paint to use in this scenario. Um, I know that's pretty basic, but you know, that's often where there's a good engagement opportunity foot in the door, um, you know, is through chalk and paint and all of that um, before the hard mahi and the hard conversations. Um, my my Fakaro, um, uh, to to the crew is really that um, we've got opportunities through placemaking Aotearoa to at any moment um, host a quick Zoom hui or anything like that to actually nut out a particular issue or if someone's hit a hit a barrier or anything like that because I suppose the reinforcement of this um, network much like your community of practice is that um, if you're facing a problem or a challenge chances are someone else's as well so you're providing a benefit to everyone else. Um, and it's it's, um, it's sharing the load um, in terms of the issue rather than um, you having to sweat it out on your own in your own little closet there. So that's just me. Fano Fano. Um, Keegan, thank you for that. I think um, it the point that you touched upon about like just having kind of a it, how can we all work together to solve a problem and and um, is it you know, the innovating streets community of practice or is it the placemaking um, Aotearoa community of practice? And um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about, because one thing that I felt was missing a little bit in our community of practice was the placemaking um, component and, and talking about it. And so it's not just at the end where you're trying to troubleshoot something um, and you're like, oh, I need, a, I need a placemaker quick. Let me find one. Um, it's getting in before that and starting to talk about the importance of it. And I think a lot of people, um, especially a lot of the transportation and traffic engineers might not even know what placemaking is. Like, in it, and as a lot of the survey results I show, it's kind of like, oh yeah, we can do that. That's just paint on a road. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Some plants in a planter box, we can do that. But it's so much more and it, it really showed that we're not, we don't know what we don't know, right? And, um, so how would you, and I, this is a question out to the group, um, how do you see, um, yeah, what, what type of system is set up to be, to start to broaden our reach um, across the country and especially through um, s large organizations like Waka Kotahi that are um, very much entrenched in delivering concrete infrastructure projects? Is it more guests at like, um, is it just sharing, is it sharing webinars across um, each platform or is it ha like bringing people into the community of practice and holding space for at the beginning people to talk about um, placemaking? I'll jump in there again, just buy some time for others to get the get the ticker working. That's all cool. Um, hey. I, I think there's been some really cool success where there is convergence between communities of practice, right? Like I think, I mean, COVID in particular has just like pushed people into um, being parts of all these little different groups. And nine times out of 10, you got some people that thread through all of those and can provide um, you know, a cross-purpose for Karo for that. Um, and, and a lot of the time, what, what we've found in Aorohi is that um, it's sometimes it's not the message, it's the messenger and being able to have shared allies in the transport sector that get enough about, say, placemaking to then um, assist with the influence there and then vice versa in other areas. You know, we're working well with, I suppose, like um, uh, pulling things through from the Urban Design Forum, for instance, and then hopefully that reciprocation occurs as well. Um, so I suppose other groups are really hungry for that. You know, I'm seeing Damien's um, beautiful mug on the on the um, Zoom here. He's massive in terms of the play workforce um, that Sport New Zealand co-papa um, kind of hold. Um, and same there, you know, it's like um, play is its own co-papa in itself that needs to be protected, but also how placemaking can um, enrich that play co-papa and how play can be um, utilised as a successful tool for that. Uh, likewise, that relationship between the transport sector as well, um, and and I think there's there's an I think because something like a placemaking network always has a really strong um, level of diversity around the different um, uh, whakapapa work wise that people come from, um, 
anyone anyone can be picked to actually talk to that from a transport angle, for instance, you know, or from a community development angle or a marketing angle and all of that stuff. So there's there's guaranteed to be guaranteed to be an easy way to do like a placemaking, what's placemaking 101 for transport professionals. So it it starts with the what they know and leads them into the what they should know. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it, that makes sense. It's a it's a thread that can be common across a lot of different sectors. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if Engineering New Zealand wanted to poach someone from placemaking Aotearoa to do a talk, no, we'd jump at the chance for sure. And I think we'd, we'd, we'd be sport for choice in terms of who could represent that. Yeah, so, so it sounds like, Keegan, there's a real, um, there's a need for an intentional approach across the system to be linking these communities up, right? So how do we sort of grow that as a, as a program of things that happens to make sure we've got that sharing happening? Like, let's be really intentional about it. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of questions coming up in the chat, uh, particularly on uh, what we spoke about at the start, which was the storytelling piece. And I think what's important to look at here is the storytelling that happens between practitioners that are working in this space um, to support people so that, uh, that uh, uh, people can sort of express their own vulnerability and learning a new way of doing things, um, can also express their frustration and, um, and, and, and the absolute tiresome um, uh, sort of process that we went through. That's one big part of the system thing to support people on that process, right? Um, the other part that people are asking about is how is it used in projects? Um, so we've had we've had a couple of people working with us and, and particularly working with um, with journalists within communities to be able to tell these stories and trying to pitch these stories to um, to a range of media outlets because we know that when there's a really great relatable story that's coming up with someone from the community it's a great way for us to um, to counter the uh, the clickbait headlines that we're seeing um, and Peter just mentioned to me in the in the chat it's it's much like how we're seeing the vaccine headlines versus the really wonderful stories of of all the sort of stuff that's going on so um, we've had uh, we've had Jaleesa Gracewood working with us who some of you would know from uh, Bike Auckland and a number of other places who's a, a wonderful storyteller um, we've we've got some videos coming out um, that also interview uh, interview people on these really wonderful stories about their involvement in the process. Uh, and it's that sort of thing that we're trying to ramp up and, and really trying to build that because we need to be intentional about getting these great stories out there. Yeah, I think mean, that's a really good point, Cam. The, the, the challenge with um, planting those stories is that we, you know, again, we, we did as much as we could. We had a really good relationship with Onihanga News, the local suburban newspaper, where for three or four months before the project started, before, I think before we even applied for the funding, we kind of planted the idea with them that this is what was happening because they were running stories on the car accidents in Onihanga. Like their headline, their front pages before this project started was the carnage in Onihanga from, from vehicles. And um, so we saw ourselves as complementary to their editorial narrative while at the same time allowing them to be neutral and criticize if needed. Um, we also worked with Simon Wilson and, and other um, you know high profile reporters to make sure that they understood the why and the how and who the storytellers were. Um, but the challenge was um, that's not enough. You know, the, the, the we saw the precursor to what we're seeing this year with um, misinformation and and doubting um, uh, the media companies. We had lots of people saying that um, you know that that uh, Simon Wilson was biased, or that we'd paid for ads to be placed in the Onihanga News, or. Um, or, and then we had young reporters kind of looking for a way to make a name for themselves by quite, um, as you saw from the headline before, just inaccurate headlines just to get the, the clicks. And um, it is a real challenge for how we tell stories. We, as Cam mentioned, we need to tell stories. Um, but unfortunately, the ones that we're getting pumped through were the, the most negative stories when actually what we were seeing on the ground was very, very different. And Boops is really well placed to talk about that because she was in the she was doing the surveying for us. And she spoke to hundreds of amazing people which this project made a huge difference to so maybe boots you can give an insight to the difference between on the ground face-to-face -face kanohi, kanohi um, versus what people were seeing in the media yeah and i guess kia ora koutou, ara homai. i'm sorry i was late um i missed the first half but what i can say about the surveys if you can hear me is that um 
we used Inhabit Place, which was a tool from Australia. So we spoke about using the network. So we used placemaking Aotearoa to connect to Australia. And we used these Inhabit Place surveys, which are on the ground. And we actually used a lot of the other networks to find our surveyors. So they were good with speaking with people and they were welcoming and we had a wide range of people. So we didn't have like just a journalist. We had an elderly woman. We had an elderly man who was maybe between the age of not elderly, 50 to 60. But it was amazing to see the voices, the stories we got. So you'd have a woman would walk past me, a Nana who was like 85 walked past me twice and then came in the afternoon to pick up her kid and stop to speak to our 50 year old interviewer. Um, so it made such a huge difference to have a diverse range of people collecting stories and then be out there for drop off and pick up. Um, and then they would see us in the morning driving by and they would be so happy to share us their feedback. And it was split and sometimes one way or the other but it was mostly split and people who thought everyone hated it or people thought everyone loved it. It just showed the deep stories of if someone loved it, why? And they were so thankful that we came out there. There are people that didn't have internet access to give their feedback online. There are people that couldn't work the form or didn't want to find the post box or walk to the library. So I think there was such a huge value to have this app where we put it in real time and the data was collected. We had a report generated within 24 hours to share real feedback um, and honest feedback without any sided one-sided or this so that was just an example and we did that at every site and it really gave you a bigger picture and it graphed out interest and i really value that uh, tool we had but again it was the same problem that we only got the green light for it halfway through the timeline so i think in the future if we can navigate better timelines and where funds go within within those time frames, it would make such a big difference. We would have had way more data and better stories even then. And there was a real richness to that data, which in theory should have been really helpful for decision makers. Um, but unfortunately, they were more interested in the headlines and what the Facebook communities were saying than what Boopsy was presenting in the data, which was really rich. Um, uh, objective feedback and heartfelt stories of the differences that these projects were making. Uh, but instead, you know, some of the decision makers involved uh, were purely going off the headlines. And that's not just the decision makers, but it's also senior management who are risk adverse to these types of um, negative uh, projects. So really want to kind of balance, there's a real role for placemakers to, to highlight the fact that what is read in the headlines isn't always the truth, because you guys are so much closer to the ground, capturing those those stories and and um, presenting them in ways which are much more engaging than you know 30 seconds of um, of clickbait on a website hmm. I think um, just thinking about Pete what you were saying uh, the way that people are making decisions particularly at say an executive level or an elected member level and there's a there's an acute reaction to um, to, to the media storm that we hear about um, what we're building into this next program is uh, is communities of practice for uh, people in the executive, for people who are elected members, to be able to uh, build that education and trust in a process to look beyond the headlines, um, and also to be able to share their own stories of change uh, through that process, so that they're more confident to um, to make decisions based on a wider amount of information. Keegan, you've got your hand up. I saw. Yeah, thanks. I don't mind if I'm uh, consuming any time, so I'll, I'll try and be quick. Uh, I, I think um, so. When I, when you think about okay, how do we how do we share good influence across like the transport sector? I mean, it, it, there's there's places for that, right? It's it's fairly easy. Um, place making, there's now the place for that. You know, it's fairly easy. Other groups, um, you know, most of these sector sector at the sector level, most of them have a place to be able to do a rack up at if they need a rack up. Um, Management level though, eh? Um, not so much. Um, I think I can only really point to like Soljum, like um, Society for Local Government Managers or whatever it is. But that's where, you know, um, and I'm not just speaking on, on behalf of my council, but, but my peers and other councils is that's where all the holdups are. That's where the, they need to be told to chill out and actually let people have those cups of tea because it's the cups of tea that save your ass when you end up with um, the, you know, the sensationalist reporter who's just come out of, um, you know, a BCom degree and wants your your neck 
um, for just any any clout. Oh, I've been there. Um, and and it's so you know the only reason why I suppose like I'm reflecting on my career that I've been able to achieve anything that I've been able to achieve is because I've had a good trusting relationship with the management above me. Mm. And where it's ever been an issue, it's usually been cross management. Um, and it's it's how do we how do we kind of influence um, Soljum to step up to the plate a little bit and be like, bro, you you need to sort your um, your hapori out a little bit, eh? Um, but yeah, maybe a bit too candid. Um, Honesty I think is you've hit it on there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, yep. I completely, I agree. And it's being able to, if the people that are on the ground get it, that's okay. But it's the people that are managing and then directing and giving funds to a lot of this and allowing you to allocate time to different projects. Um, that's where, yeah, change really does need to be made. So it's okay to say to a transport engineer, yeah, this is about placemaking, but if their manager won't give them the time to do that, then what's the point? We have, um, we're at 12.55, conscious that people's days are filled with um, these sorts of online things, but we've got two people with hands up and Ruth Maloney, you were the first before Denise Bijou, I think. Hi, um, my name is Ruth. So I work for Auckland Transport and I'm a community transport coordinator. So I work um, with schools in Auckland um, and I worked on the Greylin project and also the Point Chev Power Up um, Play Street stuff. Um, and I guess from my point of view, what was really helpful was asking people to make the decision like to frisky problems. So for example, with Graylin, we could foresee who would be involved and what problems we, some of the community members might have with that project. And so telling people upfront, these are things that we're going to have to deal with. And once they could make the decision upfront going, yeah, AT, we support this project, not no matter what, but we acknowledge those problems, it's upfront about it, and you can really front foot. And when people are kind of, well, we know that this will be a problem, it's upfront and we're still committed. Once you have that, that's quite helpful with the whole project. Um, and the other thing is timing is quite important. With Graylin, we did a bit of um, engagement with the school before Christmas. But then people that were in year six changed schools in February. And there was that big gap of months between when we initially engaged and to when we actually got back to them in February, March, because they weren't in school. Term one was super busy. So timing is really tricky with schools as well. Um, and I think just acknowledging and factoring in that time frame. Um, and so if you have a little bit of a plan, know when it will all or not know what will happen now um but you may not be able to know when and that helps people as well um with the school's um perspective thank you those were great projects so thanks ruth for putting in all your your effort into that um, thank you for a little bit of time here too i just wanted to bring back to the question around placemaking aotearoa so we're a collective we do this mahi in our voluntary time. So um, I can hear just a couple of thoughts from, from that perspective um, that I totally agree with most of what has been said, cups of tea, growing community champions, all those sorts of things, lots of learnings. There's a great website for placemaking Aotearoa now. So these are the easiest thing for us to do is share. Um, so there's, I've just put the learn page in there. That tool, Boopsy, would be awesome to be up there. Um, there are books you can add, your evaluations, things like that. Um, we have, <laughs> I like the t-shirt logos, um, thank you, as well on the chat uh, idea. Those sorts of things are really easy to do. We've heard a number of times, not just this week, about the idea of placemaking 101. And that reminds me of our welcome chat page where we don't talk about what placemaking is, but why. I think tactical urbanism is different to placemaking. They can be tools for each other. So there's a some nuancing perhaps that could be done, some conversational style 101 if it needs to be 101, but it's almost a 101 and why rather than what or how, why and how, 
perhaps open to challenge on that. Um, but the idea of peer review or phone a is really good. And if we can somehow systematize that and resource it for people, there's some really great knowledge and experience from all sorts of people with and without formal qualifications. And I think that's a really awesome way the the kopapa for placemaking Aotearoa is to uplift, right? So let's uplift each other. I think that would be really good, some way of doing that. And I would have probably have to promote the Kuma Awards there too, but that's a whole other conversation, waka kōtahi. Um, <laughs> and I guess the final thing for me that I was thinking is that strategies are all very good, but I think it was Peter Drucker that says culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I totally applaud the going to management and things, but it's not just about strategy and what. Again, it's around why and how, and really how we do that is place making Aotearoa, I don't know but it reminded me that it's more than just the doing, it's the being, the seeing. Yeah, kia ora. Kia ora. thank you. So we are on one o'clock whanau. Um, I have a little bit of time to stick around if people feel like it, otherwise, um, uh, if you've got to get to the next thing or you're desperate for something to eat or a drink, please uh, thank you for your time and. Um, uh, feel free to hit the exit button. Um, otherwise, uh, happy to stick around for a couple of other questions if people um, if people are really engaged with this discussion. Damien, if you're sticking around, I'd love to talk about your the comment that you put in the the chat. Um, so I completely agree with you in that, um, and in that the tactical urbanism projects or the way that we've been talking about them is that they are, um, it's like building it, it's an interim project. It's building like a pipeline of shovel ready projects so that there's something else that's coming beyond this thing that's here. But oftentimes that, that holding space is, um, tells a much richer story and is more interactive and more fun than what the permanent solution of will be. And um, I wonder, and I, I totally think that you're spot on. And you see that from examples across the country where they show the three stages, right? Where it's like a pop-up and then it's this interim and then it's the permanent solution that usually the permanent solution looks gray and like it has, you know, white and yellow lines all over it and then where did all the color go and where did the people you know, like the the stories go with that um and so i wonder if um as we're starting to think about like how you measure success of these projects not just in like what the interim solution is but maybe what in the what needs to be carried over into the permanent solution maybe that's how we make we ensure that stories are continuously told through that um permanent solution and, and that they're in the final design um, and that I don't know I'm totally want to hear what you're like what you're thinking too like how do you carry the storytelling in the place and storytelling of that place through to a permanent project and not just with bright colors in the interim yeah I, I definitely think that that's one one way to, to, to explore it the the experience I had of sitting on one of the co-design teams with my with my day job play advocate hat for Sport Wakato on and then my extra uh, curricular hat I suppose uh, of, of parkour was bringing a play lens to, to the work that was happening um, for the two projects in Hamilton and in terms of thinking about play and how children are going to interact with those spaces and the things that they want and at, for them as people and low people low to the ground and you know seeing um spending a lot more time uh looking at uh you know what's actually on the on the footpath and on the floor um the the color and the storytelling and all those things seem so much more important for children versus the drivers who are upset about changes to the network and and, and those sort of things but in looking at here's our co-design process now, here's the sort of interim design that it looks like we're going to have as our, our roughly right piece that's going to go in to test, and then this would inform what it might look like in this space, and as you say, yeah, 
it basically looked grey again. Um, and I'm definitely of agree with the you know um, active commuters who make the point that paint is not infrastructure when you're talking about cycle you know separated cycle lanes and things like that. But in these projects that were so much more about simply uh, road changes, it was about obviously it's about people and it's about connecting people and then being able to inhabit those spaces. Um, play is all about staying and dwelling in the space and so what is the the draw card to to be there um and so much of what i've seen in transport space around the draw cards to dwell or to use the network outside of being in the car doesn't look at fun no it's it about if it is it flat you know uh, are buses timely you know, are there shelters, all sorts of great practical, important pieces of the puzzle, but don't meet children's needs in terms of, you know, is there a swing in the bus stop? Is there a, yeah. you know... Um, is there a jump in the middle of the road that I can, you know... Yeah, and, and, and does the paint <laughs> stay there because does it invite the interaction that might not be there, you know, as someone who does parkour or, or a skateboarder, someone might use the drab, ugly-looking stuff anyway because they have the vision to see it. Um, but if you haven't got that vision, where's the prompt? So where is that storytelling? Where's the, the suggestion that actually this is a place for you to inhabit and play with, um, with and that I loved all the, you know, I, I think in Hamilton, people thought some of the stuff on Ward Street was garish and it was too bright and all these issues and things. I just thought it was fun um, and yeah. don't want to see more of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm okay. conscious. Fano, that uh, I just invited you to stick around when Sophia and Ella from Catalyze uh, are the people who are running this show and I railroaded it. And so I apologise, Sophia and Ella, if, um, I, if I'm keeping you back. Um, okay, so that's cool. I'm getting the thumbs Absolutely up, but this is great. okay to have a chat. Absolutely great conversation. Just keep no, going. Happy to, happy to yeah. carry on. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna, I, I was going to touch on that, Damien, because I... The, and going back to the theme of this at the beginning about planning as gardeners rather than architects, um, you know, we were trying to solve a problem of safety for pedestrians. And on the first night that those boxes we were installed, we realised that what we'd actually done is installed the only um, playground which is lit at night in all of Auckland. Without even thinking about it, because you don't put lights on playgrounds apparently from a SIPTED perspective, but all of a sudden at nine o'clock at night, we had kids doing parkour between the boxes because there was a street light above these boxes that we'd put in place to solve uh, the traffic intervention. And then the following night, um, there was a radio controlled car race Grand Prix going on in this new little well-lit um, painted beautiful space. And then it just kept evolving. And these were never things that we'd originally intended the space to be used for. All we wanted to do was put a box at that end and a box at that end to keep the cars away and kind of make it kind of um, habitable in the middle. But the public were the ones that, the kids in particular, as you said, were the ones that actually thought of stuff that the adults were never going to come across because they were too focused on, you know, what's the purpose? So I'm all for that sort of thing. I mean, I think it's so frustrating. Uh, and I don't know whether people saw on my Twitter feed this morning there was an image of a guy walking his kids to school and that broke my heart because I interviewed that guy six months ago and he was glowing because for the first time ever his kids had walked to school by themselves and that meant that him and his partner had so much more time in the morning um, and so I got a vox pop of him saying that and here we are six months later after the LTA has been ripped out and I see an image of him in a corner of a street walking his kids to school and that freedom is gone purely because a couple of growing ups um, weren't willing to take an extra 90 seconds to two minutes longer to get to their destination. So we've got to be more um, considerate of unknown potentials when we do these types of projects. Yeah, I was thinking about unknown potentials because um, Damien, I went to ha Hamilton and had a nosy because my actual original job is working in restaurants. So I always worry about the restaurants and businesses when we do tactical urbanism. And having done the projects myself before Innovating Streets, um, for instance, for Ponsby Park, we interviewed like 50 businesses before we even started promoting the park as an option. And I think there's space in the second round to make templates for a school newsletter, a template for businesses of the why and changes being done. 
Um, the biggest, your biggest, um, happiest member was the wine shop guy, actually, in Hamilton. He loved the skate park in the park because I just, Kmart, all that staff didn't know what was going on. They like, it's all the Kmart staff had no idea. They didn't know why it was there. I asked all 10 of them um, what they think is outside. Um, Burger King. So all those businesses have room to be treated as a real important stakeholder. Those people driving into those large scale businesses um, have potential if you did it again. And then I explained to them it's for the students. I could see already that 20 high schoolers are walking down there. And then after I chatted, they were like, oh, but um, also we, we don't do in New Zealand like people there during the install because I went to quite a few Innovating Streets install days. And because I'm the community person that usually does a tactile urbanism, I'm there the whole install because I got the grant. I don't, I'm, I probably have the insurance. Um, and I think in these bigger projects, we forget about like a community project lead that's paid to be on site to explain to people while it's being installed that isn't an engineer, but is just the comps person taking questions. But I definitely think um, if you made a budget, there's a place in the budget to have a comms person that's the community member that is answering questions as some of the paintings happening or as the installs going on. Um, but Hamilton, it was a, the wine shop guy couldn't stop talking about how much he loved that one. And it was, a, and the guy, the dad skating with his kid. I hope I don't, I haven't been since, but I, that, of all the ones I thought that would stay, it would be that one, Damien. Yeah, I think um, folks, you kind of talked to a, a few points that we're, we're really trying to build into that next program. Um, I think earlier on, you mentioned about like the team and just kind of having time to, to build a team. So like within the next program, that's a, a really big um, effort. And as we, when Peter talked about it, is that the team um, is really critical to the, the success of these projects. And so the next program, we're, we're holding time and space to build that team. This past year was very much a scramble of like, who can you get on board now? And we don't know if you have money yet, but just get them on board. And it's hard for people to commit to a project without knowing, actually, am I going to be employed? Like, what, what's going to happen? Um, so that's something that we're definitely changing. And then you you mentioned templates um, and, like, being able to do monitoring and evaluating potentially more standard, but then also communications. And so national communications is something that we 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 didn't have, we didn't step up to the game. You know, we said to everybody, like, um, it's important to communicate around these projects, but then, and we'd offer support, but we didn't have anything for councils to hang their hat on. Um, so we didn't have that bigger vision. And that's something that we recognize and we learned from. And so next year and this next round, we're, we're really going to put a lot of resources into a national communications, like around these projects. Um, to be able to help support the local communications. Um, and then the templates for monitoring and evaluating. Um, the, there's a lot that we can do to alleviate um, projects, spending time trying to develop survey questions or um, trying to figure out what technology is best to count a bicycle or a pedestrian, or um, how do I how how do I study spaces again? And so the 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 app that you were talking about, Inhabit Place, um, is, is a really great app. And we can look at things like that and um, other technologies that we can start just recommend to projects or even just put in place so that it alleviates any of that busy work for councils. Yeah. I think and I might that, wrap up. Sorry, just one thought there around um, the team stuff. The idea of the team not just being a companion plant gardener, but being a companion plant. So not just, you know, a benevolent dictator, if you like, whether that's council or Kapotahi or whoever, the designers, you know, thinking of how their temporary become permanent and so much gets lost. Um, how do you cultivate a team that is a team of companion plants that is an ecosystem? You know, just to build on, riff off your gardening metaphor. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I think that that Thank was... You beautiful and like analogy and connection to the gardening metaphor and um yeah we did see that that the projects that were the most successful were projects that um community partnerships were like um 
were employment within that local community. So they were a part of the team. So it wasn't just like, oh, this is a community partnership and we're bringing you to a workshop and you're giving your opinion. It's like, no, we value your talents, your skills, um, and you have a, play, a role to play in this project. And so some of the most successful projects might have had a core team of maybe like four people, but were supported by a lot of people in the community that were getting paid to do um, small tasks, but really in critical tasks. Um, so th that's a model that we definitely need to build on. And it's something different um, from what government is set up to do, like our procurement pro our procurement rules sometimes prohibit us from employing somebody down the street to do something. They need, they're not on this list. Are they on this list? No, they're not. Um, and so we really need to change that. Yeah, I think it's beyond just employing people to do tasks as well. It's about the co-design and the decision-making. Yeah, um, you're right. It's actually a different level of engagement and it's a creative, expansive thing rather than, I mean, we all have to have boundaries and they're good. They help us to focus, but um, yeah, letting that leadership come um, from within as much as from above, if you like, or without. You're right. And it's transparency in the decision making. It's not It's not saying you're a community partner and I'm going to go over here and make this decision by myself. It's mm -hmm. you're at the table you're, all the time. You're a community partner to deliver X, um, whereas they might have thought Y was a better way of yeah. doing it or something. And how do you have that conversation in a genuinely inclusive companion planting kind of way rather than being the gap? <laughs> You know, yeah. it's really hard for government. I acknowledge that. That's your yeah. role. It, it, it is hard, but. Um, Time for things to be done differently the way. Yeah, we're here to challenge that system and to do things differently, to yeah. be able to make things more fun. Okay, I'm, I know, at, at 1.15, I have to. I have to shoot off because I, I have to make lunch in between uh, a couple of other meetings. So um, oh. perfectly happy for this to carry on, but I'm going to need to shoot off. Uh, there's a few really good actions out of today, which is the Fano Fano thing. Like how can we put some uh, real system and framework around that? Um, the intentional connecting up of other groups. So how can uh, Waka Kortahi be a facilitator of those connections? Um, so how can we sort of put a program in place to make sure that people are joining up um, and then there's a couple of other wonderful things there Denise thank you from the uh, riffing off the gardener thing um, I might leave you to it um, I, also I, I will go, that's right Michelle did you have a question I can hang around for five or so minutes if there's one last question left we'll let these guys shoot off or you're just saying hi oh you're, you're muted, muted. <laughs> oh yeah just a quick question um hi I'm Michelle so I was a year free graphic designer student. Um, and so just a quick question I had about the Only Hunger um, Pie Box project. Sure. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, would it have been possible to add, um, I guess, like signages um, informing like drivers um, about the change that was going to happen, like on the street itself? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all wonderful ideas, um, which we all came flooding in as soon as we put the boxes in the road to say, you should have done it this way, you should have done it this way. Um, difficult to actually put on the ground, though. So so one of the suggestions uh, which people had, which made sense initially when you kind of on first look, was those digital signs that you have, the kind of orange roadwork signs, which you can type messages in, and it, you know, it might say, you know, this road is closed, take detour. Um, we closed an entire block, like a one kilometer by one kilometer block, um, stopping 5,000 cars a day with about 12 different entry points. So for that to work, we would have needed probably four or five or six of those digital signs there for the entire length of the trial. Now the trial was supposed to be three months long. Those signs are kind of about three or $400 a day to hire because they're designed for kind of road work, short term stuff. Um, so when you extrapolate that out and, and same with comms, you know, we were heavily criticized about not getting more comms out. Why didn't you tell more people about what was going on? When we calculated how much it would have cost to put a, a multiple letterbox drops, because what you had is you do a letterbox drop, but maybe, you know, um, the husband in the house has a senior moment and throws it straight in the recycling. Then all four other people in the house are denied that information. So how do you solve that? You do multiple letterbox drops. So you might do three over the course of three months. Now, what we worked out is we could have spent, to get a level of confidence that everyone knew the project was coming, we could have spent 70% of the budget 
on flyers and we would have hand on heart known that every single person in Auckland would have known about the project, but we would have had no money left to do the project. So there's always that tension between how much money do we put into making sure every single penny, you know, as many people as possible can know versus how much are we actually going to hold off to actually do the implementation. Now, what we didn't know when we put the application together is that it's ridiculously expensive. The construction companies are making a horrendous amount of money okay. on yeah, traffic management plans. Um, we thought we'd saved money by going for those wooden boxes and filling them with sandbags to stop people tipping them over. The, the, the construction company was making an $8 markup per sandbag. We could have bought that sandbag from Bunnings for $3. They were charging us $11. And there was 10 or 12 sandbags per box. And we had over 100 boxes. So when, when you thought you were saving yourself some money by choosing the wooden box, which was only $80 instead of $200 for a concrete block, by the time you extrapolated out all the elements of that installation, we were better off getting the concrete block, but we didn't know that until after the implementation had started. So there was lots of things that in hindsight we would have done differently. I just would have gone for concrete blocks from the start and I got kids to paint them like they did in Papatori and Mangani because that worked really, really well. Um, but things like signage was difficult. Um, there was absolutely the intent to put signage up on the major intersections, which were bumping spaces, as Jim Dears would say. Um, and that was a big part of our approach was how do you work out where the most people are going to be at the mo you know, most of the time and have those conversations face to face. The, the, the problem was those people aren't in cars. It's really easy to someone to see stop and read a sign and spend some time as they walk past and actually ingest that information at a rate that they can tolerate versus a car going past at 50 kilometers an hour only goes through there once a day, is more interested in what's happening on their phone or the stereo um, and probably not going to hear the message until you put a wooden box in the road and say stop. So I think what we learned is we wouldn't do it as uh, such a radical solution next time around. And we do a much more incremental change of people's behavior over time, rather than sort of try and stop them in their tracks. And because um, we did turn some people's worlds upside down, you know, it was quite traumatic for some people who felt there was comparisons to the Berlin Wall. Um, there was all sorts of things uh, which came out. It was a really emotive response from people. So um yeah so you're totally right science would have helped and amazing graphic designers like you guys who understand font and size and messaging uh is absolutely critical uh then it becomes about execution and and how do you take the expertise that you bring as a graphic designer and a sign maker and add that into the restrictions that um these types of projects unfortunately place Thank you for that, because I was having the idea as you were saying the signage, like maybe even just like the ones they have for voting, like those kind of bigger billboards and maybe just having the message split into words across as they drive past. And yeah, totally. Have that a makes, bit of a warning. Yeah, totally. That makes perfect sense. And we, and we had um, signs up on lampposters for like six months before the project started but people didn't see them until we put a box uh, in the middle yeah. of the road, you know? So it's like, no one told me about this. There's no signs up. And it's mm -hmm. like, you're standing in front of a sign. See that sign behind you? That's been there for the last six months. Oh, well, I didn't yeah. see it. I didn't know it was about this project. Well, yeah, because you didn't realize that the sign yeah. says traffic will change. You didn't expect someone to close a road. So it was definitely uh, a case of um, first off the cab off the ranks and, and then learning lots of lessons of how to do it better. Um, and they were really low budget projects compared to um, traditional projects. So that's why groups like you are really critical because that blue sky thinking is critical to um, breaking down some of the more systemic problems and youth and, um, and expertise other than traffic engineers is really important to shape that. Thank you so much and sorry for holding you all back. Not Thanks at all. So no, much. feel free to get in touch. Um, and it's been awesome. I know there's only a few of us left, but it's been awesome to contribute to the conversation. And